you know, I was thinking about this, and, and as we think about our culture today, you know, we live in a world where we travel over the world and where we see pictures from all over the world. And as a result, we're able to often see, you know, peoples from different parts of the world and unusual rituals, things that they do. A lot of times, you know, religious rituals, you know, people walk on fire to, uh, to purify themselves for some religions. You go down to Central America, people are climbing up stairs on their hands and knees, going over glass to try to prove their devotion. Uh, you know, some are just really unusual. Let me give you a couple examples that you just, you know, wonder, where did these come from? For 700 years in a, in a temple in western India, parents have, have gone to this temple and they asked the, the clerics, the priests basically, to drop their infants from the top of that t- tower and, and they, they drop it, believing that in doing so, it's going to make their children more intelligent, braver, luckier, healthier. Generally, it's children that are one to two years old. They go to the top of the tower, and they drop them from the top of the tower. And there are people on the bottom that are waiting with these sheets to catch them. And uh, so they drop them down there, they catch them, and then they're handed off to the parents. And, and this is something that they've, again, been doing for hundreds of years. What's interesting is that you know, it's something that is, is in part of India, and even as it has kind of expanded, that both Muslims and Hindus both do this and both see it as part of their religious practice. Now, that's an unusual thing. You say, how in the world did that, that ever somebody think of that? You know, when you think about this being a spiritual practice, how in the world is dropping your child from a 50-foot tower, how, how in the world is that something that is spiritually significant? Now, let me give you another example. Uh, after Easter on Sunday evenings, we're going to be doing a class on the cults, Christianity and the cults, and looking at some different cults and, and what they believe. And one of the cults we're going to be spending some time with is the Mormon church. And one of the more unusual rituals of the Mormon church is the fact that they, I don't know how to say this, but they have sacred underwear. And uh, now, now they, they don't call it sacred underwear, they call it their temple garments, but it basically is a set of underwear that's, you know, after you go to the temple, they go to this special washing and anointing ordinance where you became a full Mormon, and at that point you're given this special set of underwear. They, you know, they have some that you can get a little different now, and, and, uh, but it's got all these markings on it, and you're supposed to wear it at all times. I mean, you know, it's something that is very, very important. Now, if you ask a Mormon about it, they won't talk about it because it's something in the temple ritual, they actually take these vows where they, you know, they, they vow that they will never talk about anything that happens in the temple ritual. And the only way we know about it is the people that have left the Mormon church and have talked about it. And so it's this, this unusual thing, and you look at this and say, what could be the possible spiritual meaning of, of holy underwear? You know, it, it's an unusual thing. Where did that ever come from? And, and we can look at this and look, man, they've got some weird, uh, you know, weird ideas, weird rituals. But, you know, as I think about this, you also think about, what about as Christians? You know, what are our rituals? I and mean, we have a couple what we call sacraments, the Lord's Supper and baptism. Now, we don't think they're weird because many of us have been raised with doing that. That's something that we've seen since we were children. But what if you were from a different part of the world? What would you think? I mean, in a couple of weeks, we're going to talk about the Lord's Supper on, on, on Good Friday. And, uh, but you think about that, you say, okay, we've got the Lord's Supper, we've got this, the Lord's meal, and tiny little bread. You know, it's like, gee, are you guys into fasting? You guys have budget problems? You can't feed us more than this? I mean, what's the deal? You know, a little tiny juice. I mean, come on, what's, you know, this is supposed to be a meal. And you could realize that if somebody is totally on the outside, they're like, what in the world is the meaning? What is the significance of this? Or how about baptism? You know, what is baptism? What does it mean? What is the significance? Where does it come from? Some of the things you look at these, these traditions and, and you think it's some religious leader said, this is important and it seems like it came out of nowhere. Well, how about baptism? Where did that come from? And again, why do we do it? You know, we're going to see this morning is, is not only do we celebrate baptism, but we're going to see that the Bible we do it because the Bible calls us to it, and it not only calls us to it, but it teaches us why it's important and what is the beauty and the significance. Now, before we dive into Colossians 2 and the main passage we're going to look at this morning, to understand it all, we have to go back to the foundational things. You know, Paul has been taught some really foundational things in Colossians 1, and we almost need to go back to this every week because it's all building on this. 
In Colossians chapter 1, verses 16 and 17, he said this, For by him all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things were created through him and for him. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. And here's what he's saying, is what we have to realize, the foundational truth that everything that we're talking about that is built upon is that we were created by Christ Jesus and we were created for Christ. It's not only that we were created by him, that's, that's the starting point, that he is the creator, he is the one in whom, you know, that, that everything finds its source. But not only were we created by him, we were also created for him, to have a relationship with him. As we've said before, you know, that we were created with this God-shaped vacuum at the very core of our being. And so we were created with this need for relationship with God. And when we have that relationship with God, life works. And when we don't have that relationship with God, it doesn't work. It's natural for us when we don't have that relationship to try to put all kinds of things into that. So we've got this vacuum and we're trying to pursue, boy, if I could find significance and meaning, if I have the right relationship, if I have, you know, pursue, you know, um, you know, if I find the right job, if I have significance there, if I get enough money, if I have the right toys, if I have this or that, and we go through life trying to somehow fill that ultimate desire. And what the Bible teaches is that all the things that we would put in there will satisfy for a brief period of time, but they'll ultimately leave us empty. And that's why he said, as we said it just a moment ago, in verses 16 and 17, all things were created through him and for him. And when we understand that, we understand he is before all things, and in him all things hold together. When we have that relationship with him, when we have Christ at the center, life works. It all holds together. All the different parts of our life. My marriage is better. My work is better. My relationships with other people are better. My, my finances, everything works because I have God at the center and he interprets everything else. And when God's not at the center, if he's not there holding all things together, then it all starts to wobble. It starts to fall apart. And it's not only that we, we, we don't have the center, we're, we're desperately seeking something. It's everything else doesn't make sense. Now, that's what we're created for, but the problem is that the Bible teaches that we're all sinners. We were created for relationship with God, but because we are sinners, we're alienated from that. So he said in Colossians 1.21, and you who are, were once uh, alienated and hostile in mind, doing evil deeds, all of us by nature, that's where we start. We're alienated from God by our sins. We're cut off from that relationship that we're designed for. We're unable to fix it. And because of that, we're hostile in mind. It doesn't mean that all of us hate God, but we hate the idea of surrendering our life to God. Oh, we might like the idea of God, we might even pursue Him, but I really don't want to surrender everything. I don't want to surrender control. Why? Because we're doing evil deeds. There's something in our life that all of us know that I, I know this is wrong and I don't want to give it up. And so therefore, because we're alienated from God, we're cut off by our sin, we realize that there's something there. And, and, and many people realize there's something broken that cannot be fully you know, filled by the things of this world. So what do we do? We go to religion. And religion, as we've seen, is, is man's attempt to somehow fix this relationship with God. If I keep the right rules, if I do the right things, that somehow I'll fix it. But the Bible teaches that we cannot fix it. All our attempts fail. See, Christianity isn't a story about a religion. It isn't about here's the things that you do. It's, it's anti-religion. It rejects the whole concept of every other religion. Christianity isn't saying here's how we work our way towards God. It's a story that says that God has come to us. We cannot reach up and get, grab God, so God reaches down and grabs us. And the question is, will we then accept that, that God's hand? So that's what he says, verse 22. We were hostile, alienated, uh, hostile in mind, doing evil deeds. But what happens? He has now reconciled in his body of flesh by his death in order to present you to holy and blameless and above reproach before him. Jesus Christ came and he was the holy and blameless one. He lived the perfect life that earned God's favor. But on the cross, he took our sin and he took the punishment for our sin. So that when we accept him, he takes all our sin upon himself on the cross and he gives us his righteousness. So we are then holy and blameless. There is nothing that separates us from God at that point in time. That's beautiful. That's the heart of the Christian message. Now, as we go then from that to say that's the foundation, then we go to Colossians chapter 2 and look at verse 8. 
Because we see here, he says, that's the heart of the good Christian message. But even as Christians, we can get distracted by that. Look at verse 8 of Colossians 2. If you look in your Bible, he says, no one, see to it that no one takes you captive by philosophy and empty deceit, according to human tradition, according to the elemental spirits of the world, and not according to Christ. And what's he saying? He says that we've got to realize that even as Christians, even in the church, we're going to have, we're going to have people that are going to attack us. And what they're going to try to do is they're going to try to give us deception, an empty deception of finding our identity in anything but Jesus Christ. That's what he talks about when he says the empties of philosophy, or the dangers of philosophy and empty deceit. He says, what are they? They're according to human tradition, according to the elemental spirits of the world and not according to Christ. Here's what he's saying. What we look at as we look by the world standards, we find wisdom. This seems to work. This seems to be an answer. And, and they're not according to Christ. And it's oftentimes that they don't reject Christ, they just leave Christ out. And you know, again, the sad thing is that I see this in churches. I see increasingly you have churches that will come out and we'll talk about Christ in general, but then we'll go out and we'll preach all these very practical messages and we won't really talk about the cross, we won't talk about sin, we won't talk about repentance. We'll talk about the wisdom in God's word and here's the wisdom and if you do this, your life will work better. Is there wisdom in God's word? Yes. Can you follow that wisdom and will life work better? Yeah, yeah. But you know what? At the core, our problem isn't that we're living foolishly. Our core of our problem is that we're separated from God. And we could go out there and we can say, I have all these ideas that are good, and we can follow all these ideas, but if we do not have this relationship with God restored, you know, we can be trying to do all the things to have the best marriage we can, to raise our kids well, and, but you know what? My problem is that I'm a sinner. My problem is that I need God to change my heart and I cannot be the husband that God has called me to be unless I let God change me. Unless I admit to him, God, I'm an angry person. I'm a selfish person. And it's not just that I need to follow your wisdom. I need you to change me. And what happens is that he says, watch out because there's this empty deception. Something that sounds good and that when you grab it, it seems like it's good, but when you bite in deep, it's, it's empty. It's hollow. And again, even in churches, we can buy into this idea. And what we realize, realize is that, our, is there wisdom? Yes. But ultimately, what we all need is we all need a relationship with Jesus Christ. That's what we were created for. And if we do not have that relationship with Jesus Christ, if we don't fix that, we can try to do everything else, but at the end, it's going to be empty and deceitful, and it's ultimately going to let us down. See, that's the dominant theme that Paul is saying. Look what he said. Let me go back and let me show you in this passage. Go and start in verse 6. And you see again and again and again. Look what he says our need is. We need to be founded in Christ. We need an identity in Christ. Verse 6. Therefore, as you receive Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in him, rooted and built up in him, and established in the faith just as you were taught, abounding in thanksgiving. Verse 8, now it's in one passage, it doesn't say it. He says, now here's the opposite. See to it that no one takes you captive by philosophy and empty deceit, according to human tradition, according to the empty spirits of this world, and not according to Christ. See to it that nobody leaves him out, but, but it's only in him the full, whole fullness of the deity uh, dwells bodily. And so you have been filled in him, who is the head of all rule and authority, in him, you were also circumcised with a circumcision made without hands by putting off the body of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ and having been buried in him in baptism in which you were also raised with him through faith in the powerful working of God who raised him from the dead. You see what he's saying? What is our desperate need? We need to find our identity in him. We need him. We need our position in Christ. See, but it's not just Christ as far as a historical figure or a good teacher. It's Christ as he is revealed in the Bible. As it says in verse 9, for in him the fullness of the deity of bodily dwells. It's recognizing that I don't need to just accept Christ and his teaching and like what he says. I don't need him just even as Savior. I need to accept him as Lord. I need to embrace him and say, God, I was created by you and for you. And unless I have you at the center, I don't have you. And it's possible that we can even come and we can misunderstand this and we can talk about Jesus Christ and, and really leave out the whole idea of the deity. Oh, we like what he says. 
There are a lot of churches that like what he says. He's a good teacher, good moral teacher. But we've got to understand, no, we accept him as God. As not only the creator, but the one who is God of our life. You know why this is so important? Why, again, in all of this, he's talking about this is who Christ is and this is what he's done. You see his deity and you see what he's done. You've got to understand both of that to have a relationship with him. Because this basic principle, the character of our Savior will always define the nature of our salvation. If you don't believe that Jesus Christ is God, you see, then you don't have a biblical salvation. Let me give you an example of some of these things. We're going to look at, a, at again, I'll, I'll give you a little pre, prelude of this whole series on the cults. The Mormons believe that Jesus Christ was not divine God eternal. He was actually a spirit baby of God and had a prior life and, and spirit child on another planet. And we're like spirit babies like Jesus. He's just older than us. And uh, Jesus was the firstborn of God the Father. The secondborn was Lucifer who rebelled against God's plan. And, uh, but there's really no essential difference between Jesus and Lucifer. He lived an earthly life, was a good Mormon, and the only difference between Jesus Christ and us is that Jesus is more advanced. In fact, a doctrinal statement of the Mormons is, as God, as God is, uh, as man as God once was, and as God is, man will become. Now, because that's their view of their Savior, their salvation is about works. Because their Savior is just a man that earned his own salvation, therefore the Savior is just an example for us to follow. You see, if you don't understand who Jesus Christ is, you'll never understand the gospel. So it's believing Jesus Christ, not who I want him to be, not who I think. You know, I'll talk to people and say, well, I don't believe that Jesus would do this. I don't, this isn't the Jesus I believe in. It's not what you think he is. That doesn't matter. It's the Jesus who is. And he's revealed himself in the Bible. And the question is, do we have a relationship with Jesus Christ as he's revealed himself? And the only way to have that relationship is by recognizing it's not what we earn, but it's by Jesus Christ coming down and reaching out to us and us then accepting what he has done in his death, burial, and resurrection. And to have this fullness in Christ, what he does, he now explains what that means, and he does so beautifully by the image of baptism. See, when you become a believer in Jesus Christ, one of the things, the first things that we'll do is we believe and are baptized. It doesn't mean we're saved by that, but it's an image of what it means to believe. And it symbolizes what it means to be in Christ, and that's what Paul develops here. See, it's not just an empty spiritual ritual. It's not wearing the underwear or doing this because somebody said. It's something that has meaning. You're not saved by it. Well, if you do this, I always remember, I've shared this before, but I remember my, my girls when they're younger, you know, they, uh, you know, they sometimes, you know, they ask dads, dad's wisdom, and then they, they don't necessarily believe it, and they'd ask me all the time, they say, you know, can dogs be saved? Can animals be saved? Do animals go to heaven? No, they can't. They don't have a soul. And, and so one day I come home, and, and you know, my, my girls are waiting there, and they said, you know, dad, I know that you told us that animals don't have souls, and they can't go to heaven, but just in case you're wrong, I, 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 I led our dog Snickers to Jesus today. You know, I prayed the prayer, and, and that was, it was Christy, and Tiffany pipes up and says, and after that, I baptized her. You know, it's like, oh, I'm glad I wasn't there for that. And, and uh, you know, but the whole idea is, is, is it just a ritual that you do, that you're saved because you need to do that? No. It's something that has incredible meaning. See, it's a sacrament. And sacra- a sacrament, like communion, but communion and baptism are both sacraments, and both of them are an outward expression of an inward reality. What both of them are doing is that they're saying, here's something that's true in my life. And I'm not saved by taking communion. I'm not saved by t- being baptized. I don't need to be baptized to be saved. But it's saying, here's something that has happened inwardly. And now I'm outwardly expressing that. I'm acting that out. So what does it express? Well, one of the things it expresses is it's a washing. The fact that here that I was sinful and now I'm washed in Christ, and I come out clean. He makes me new. And you know what? I need to take a bath on a regular basis because I get dirty again. And I took a shower this morning. You're hell happy that I did. And uh, because because I get dirty and I stink and I always have to be clean. You know the beautiful thing about baptism is you're baptized one time and we're washed and our sins are washed away and we don't get dirty again because the power of the blood of Jesus Christ washes us continuously. We are washed 
But not only how we're washed, what that we're washed, but how and what it means. You see, baptism expresses our union with Christ. And that's what he says here. And he says, well, here's how we do it. First of all, it shows how we participate in Christ's death. That literally there's an image of especially baptism by immersion. That's why we practice this. There's an image that we die, we're buried, and we rise again. First of all, how do we participate in his death? Verse 11, in him you were circumcised with a circumcision made without hands by putting off the body of flesh by the circumcision of Christ. And you say, what in the world is it there about circumcision? And that's the Old Testament, isn't it? And what, you know, what's it saying here? It says, we have been circumcised with the circumcision. Well, here's what it's saying. In the Old Testament, circumcision was a sign of entering into God's covenant people, his community. So when somebody accepted God, if they, you know, when the Jews, first of all, with, with, with Abram, when you know, people wandered away and they got right with God, they were circumcised as a sign of saying, we are identifying with, with God, with, with his covenant, with his people. And it was a sign given to all adult male converts and their infant sons at eight years old, or eight, eight days old. Now, here's what it's, we've got to realize. Never does it say that anyone was saved by circumcision. Deuteronomy 10, you know, Moses said that we need to circumcise our hearts. In Romans 2, you know, Paul talks about this idea that, you know, a man who's, a Jew was one who was not circumcised outwardly, but inwardly. That it was always an inward, it was an outward sign of an inward reality. So what was circumcision? Circumcision was identifying that I have something that needs to be removed. So now let's go back to what Paul's saying here in verse 8, or verse 11. He says, you were circumcised with a circumcision made without hands by putting off the body of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ. He uses circumcision as a metaphor for the crucifixion. And he is saying that Jesus is, is the circumcision of the cross. And it's not just stripping away a small piece because it's something that was a whole lot worse. It was our whole body. Our whole body, our whole being was something that, you know, wasn't a small piece of us and, oh boy, the sin part's gone. All of us needed to be cut off. All of us need to be removed. And as believers, when we share in this circumcision, how do we do that? By sharing in his death. By recognizing that there's something in me that is broken. Something in me that doesn't need God's help, that needs to be killed and needs to be restored. It's something in me that I need to totally surrender and say, God, I, I acknowledge you that, that I, not only that I've done wrong things, that I'm a sinner. See, it's the idea that, that Paul talked about, I think, even more clearly in Romans chapter 6. Look at what he says in uh, Romans 6, 3. Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized in Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were buried, therefore, uh, with him by baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead, by the glory of God the Father, we too might walk in the newness of life. So what is baptism? We start by recognizing that there's something in us that needs to die. Our self-will. Our demand that we are God, our, you know, our own God in a sense. And we come and we say, God, it's not that I'm saved by this, but I acknowledge this spiritually. And God, when I acknowledge that spiritually, that I need to die and I ask you to kill me. I ask you to, I ask you to, to, to literally... Kill the, the sin nature in me. Change me. And not only we died to him, in a sense, through his crucifixion, we also then identify with him being united in his burial. Look at verse 12. Having been buried with him in baptism, in which you were also raised with him through faith. And he's saying that we've spiritually participated in his death, but also in a sense of, of burial. You see, when you think about what is the burial, the burial shows the reality of the death. And so, you know, Jesus is on the cross, and they sat, check, and he's dead, and they put the spear in him, and, and the final thing is that when you, and you have the burial, then it's real. I mean, I think about funeral services, and there's a sense that when we, when we have that funeral service, you know, there's some, we know the person is dead, we've been there, but there's something incredible about being there at the end, and we close that casket. And, and we, we're there at the you know, graveside, and we throw that little bit of dirt on the, on the, on the, on the casket. And what we're saying is, this is final. This is real. And Jesus Christ, when he was buried, you know, that was a sense of we not only saw him then, but we took him down and, he, and we wrapped him up and he was dead. He was buried. It was a reality, a totality. He was laid in the grave. And that's what he's saying in the same way that when we die with Christ, it's not only that we die, but that we're buried in him in the same way. That's, that's a real death. 
You know, that, that Jesus Christ, when he died and was buried, he did so in our stead and our benefit. It's that he took upon the curse upon himself. And when we embrace Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, what we're doing is that we're saying, God, all that sin, all that I am, I, I ask you to take it upon your death, upon your burial. God, I t- ask you to take it from me and to kill it and to bury it and remove it so that it's gone. And so that I'm not only now I'm dead and I'm buried, that's baptism. I start and I die and I'm buried. And what happens at the third day he rose again in baptism as we come back up and it's a symbol that we are now raised with Christ in his resurrection. And that's the beautiful thing. That's when you come back and you should applaud when you see a baptism and you see somebody go down and you come up and we applaud when they come up because that's the imagery. It's that we have died with Christ. We have, in his death, we, are, we have been washed. But now we come up alive anew. We have been, verse 12, have been buried with him in baptism in which you were also raised with him through faith and the powerful working of God who raised him from the dead. We were dead and buried, but the fullness of Christ reaches not only the death and burial, but the resurrection that we experience the power of the resurrection. See, this isn't something that's a future reality. It's, it's not that you will be. It's that you have been. We have been buried with him. We have been raised again. We've, been ex- we've experienced the, the, you know, the resurrection power. When Jesus Christ rose from the dead, it means that he defeated sin and he defeated death. And it means that all those who trust in him, we can know his power that we can defeat sin and we can defeat death. That's what we're celebrating in a couple weeks on Easter. It's not only that Jesus Christ rose as a historical fact 2,000 years ago. It's not only that it gives us hope that after death we will once again rise again with him. But it means that we have the power to bring our sin before him and said, God, break this. Kill this in me and rise me up to be a new person. And we're going to see testimony after testimony today. We're going to see testimony after testimony two weeks from now where you see people are coming and saying, This is the power of the Holy Spirit. This is the power of the gospel. That we are dead in Christ and we are raised and we are made new people in him. See, that's the imagery. 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. The new has come. Isn't that beautiful? That's powerful. My friends, when we look at this image, that's what we're celebrating. The question is, do you have that relationship with Jesus Christ? I'm not talking about the religion. I'm not talking about the rules that you keep. I'm not saying that this is a rule to keep. I'm saying, do you have this relationship with Jesus Christ? And you know what it means. And if you have that, are you continually surrendering and say, God, I kill that old part of me. Help me to experience what it means to die with you and to be raised again. Help me to live in the victory of the resurrection. Help me to live as this this person that the old has has, has passed away and the new has come on him, a new creature in Christ. If you're here, I hope that you have, if if you've never accepted Christ, I hope and pray so you do so today. I hope and pray that as you hear these stories, you realize that it's not only what they've done, it's an invitation for what you can do. And it's a reminder of what it means for all of us to daily surrender to Christ. Now just in close, last, last thought, And then why is this important? Do we have to be baptized to be a Christian? No, no, you don't. You know why it's important? Because it's a sign of a commitment. It's a sign of relationship that we have with him. See, baptism is like a wedding ring. It's a symbol of our relationship with Christ. I I think about it this way. And I think about my wedding. I loved Sandy before, but that was a moment that I made my commitment to her. And at that time, you know, they gave me this ring. I hate to say it, it actually wasn't this ring. I actually lost the other one, but they gave me a ring that was like this. Now, the thing is, is am I married by this ring? Do you have to wear it to be married? If not, I'm in big trouble because I lost the first one. Um, No, I, I don't need to do this. But if I don't wear the ring, you have to ask why. You know, why wouldn't you want to wear that? You know what, I want to proclaim that my identity is I'm a husband of Sandy Ribka. My identity is in her and my family. I want to proclaim that. And as I look at this, it reminds me of, of who I am and her. It proclaims it to the world and it reminds me of the promises that God has given me in marriage as I pursue him. That's what baptism is. It's a way for us as we who have a relationship with Jesus Christ to say, I'm not saved by this. I don't need the ring. But you know what? Why wouldn't I want the ring? I want to declare it. I want everybody to know that I am a follower of Jesus Christ, that I identify with him in his death, 
burial, and resurrection. That's my identity. That's who I am, and I'm proud to declare it.